Dear beloved teacher, dear brothers and sisters, dear precious teens, I know you're here and I'm very happy. As you are growing up in your other adolescent years, that's your teen years and also in your twenties, there will be many storms. The storms, first of all, is of the body. The changes in your body can be so drastic. Uh, you may become, you may feel very awkward with your own body, uh, may feel alienated with your own body. You know, the growth spurt. Uh, there's just many physical changes. One day to the next, you look into a mirror, you're like, who's that looking at me? Sometimes even when you walk, you trip over because you have grown taller and you're not used to your limbs yet. You know? So that's the storm of the physical body. But of course, the storms of the, of the emotions, of the feelings, such turbulence, right? Sometimes you feel happy, you want to laugh, to sing, and then a few minutes later, a few days later, you feel like you're going to cry. You feel like, who am I? You know, what's going on? What's my place in this world? So, the storms of the emotions can be overwhelming for many of us. And we know that teenagers suffer a lot of anxiety and depression. And the rate has been increased drastically also because of the pandemic, of the isolation. It's very difficult. Many young people study online, and that's all you know. You don't have the, the human interactions as much as before. You don't, you're not face, you know, have the direct face-to-face -face contact with your peers. So that is also something of a withdrawal for your development, okay? for your body and your mind. And then, of course, there are problems in the families. They may be very difficult. The, the adults, they always wish to have time you know, to be at home, to be with you, with their children, but they're busy working. But you find out that during the pandemic, many parents have to stay home, and actually many of them face difficulties because they're not used to seeing each other so often, right? Usually people work eight hours, 10 hours a day, so you only see each other very briefly. So to constantly face your parents, and your, fa your parents have to see you all the time, and the parents have to see each other, in many families, actually, there are more arguments. And there's, you know, there's more um, tension and there's more drinking. So there are many storms. And how do we practice so that we can take care of ourselves so that the storms may pass over and we are still here instead of us being flocked away by the storms. Have you seen vi video clips or have you experienced that in a storm, it can literally like, you know, sw sweep away cars, cars fly in the air. Have you seen these images? Have you seen this? Cars fly in the air. Houses just get uprooted and fly in the air, right? So. Today, I'd like to share with you some of the practices, and I use the, the practice of beginning anew as the skeleton, because I heard that you learned to do beginning anew with your parents, right? Was it a good practice yesterday? Yeah? Did you find that it, it, it brings some open communication? Some more understanding? Yeah? Now, the practice of beginning anew, I have discovered that is most foremost important that we do it with ourselves. 
only when we can begin anew with ourselves that we can actually begin anew with others. And that practice can help us to ease the storms. Okay? To let the storm pass, but we are still anchored here. Like you see the trees, like in a storm. Which parts of the trees that sway? Can you raise your hands and share? Which parts of the trees? Yes, Ka. The Luba. Luba. Ah. Okay, so the roots will stay, right? But this part, the branches, like the branch, they will sway. The leaves will sway, right? But here, down in the roots of the tree, that's still. So we learn to be anchored deeply in the earth. So how do we practice that? Do you know that in the, in the storm, there is the eye of the storm? Have you, heard of, have you heard of it? Eye of the storm, okay? So there's a storm, like, right, like this. Very frightening. Cars and houses and, you know, animals people get swept away. They are flying in the air. But in, in this area of the storm, about 20 kilometers, okay, the diameter, about 20, 30 kilometers, it's totally still, quiet, calm, sunny, peaceful. It is here that it is dangerous. Okay? So logically we know that when there is a storm, we want to be in the eye of the storm, not out here in the storm. Does it make sense? Yeah? You are very intelligent. You understand this. So in our practice, how can we go into the eye of the storm? Can somebody tell me what you have learned these past five days in Plum Village that can help you to enter the eye of the storm? Yes, Kang. Breathing calming. Wow, see? Breathing calming, exactly. When you breathe in, and then you breathe out. Breathing in, breathing out. Breathing in, I calm my body. Breathing out, I calm my body. Yeah, you breathe like that. You relax your body. Breathing in, I calm my mind. Because our mind is a big storm. It can generate itself. And one storm after another, it feeds on itself. Yes. We. Sitting meditation. Exactly. Sitting meditation, you literally, you are like a tree, right? Here, you come back at the base, right here. You sit down. When you have a storm in your mind, so much confusion, so much sadness, so much anger, or your parents are fighting and it's breaking your heart, it's making you so angry and frustrated and helpless, you visualize this tree, huh? and you say, I want to go into the eye of the storm. I don't want to be out here and be swept away and be hurt. Hmm? I want to get to the base of the tree. I want to sit down, yeah? And I want to come back to my breath, to my breathing. And I want to calm my body, relax my body, because there's a lot of tension in the storm. Huh? In anger, in rage, in sadness, there's, there's a big storm. Yes, Ka? <coughs> Looking inward. Looking inward, exactly. You, look, you sit down, you breathe, and then you look inward. You tend to yourself, okay? That is 
being in the eye of the storm. Tell me one more practice that you have learned that can help you to enter the eye of the storm. We have sitting, we have breathing, we have looking deeply. Yes. Sharing with others. Wonderful. Yes. As young people, we have so much going on, and sometimes we, we just suppress it. We keep it all in, and it's so stuff that you actually you feel chest pain. You feel like you cannot breathe. You feel like your head is going to explode. But if you are able to share with a friend, with a teacher, with your mom or your dad, somebody you trust, you know? Sometimes you can sit under a tree and talk to a tree. And you know what? You realize, wow, my friends also have a very similar problem. Yeah. Wow, those adults, they also go through similar problems. I'm not alone. You realize it's a human experience. It's not all you. But it's a human experience that we all go through, and you feel less lonely, less isolated. Okay? So this is one way. There are many ways. The practice of walking meditation also helps you to enter the eyes of the storm, too. Do you see people pacing? You know, when they're stressed, they just like, like that. That is expressing the storm of their mind. Just going back and forth like that. So instead of being swept away by the storm, you actually slow down and you just walk one step at a time. Come back, come back, come back, come back to the eye of the storm. You remind yourself so that the storm can pass over. Now, the storm is passing over, it's calming now. It's better now. See, you walk yourself through it. Okay? We'll come back to some of these practices. But, okay, so who can tell you the first step? Who can say out loud what is the first step of beginning anew? Another way to calm the storm. Yes. Yes, wonderful. Watering the flowers. Great. Okay. The human mind works in a very funny way, just for its, for the survival purposes. We focus more on the negativity. We focus more on dangers than on happy things. You see? I mean, it makes sense, right? When our ancestors lived in the wild, in the cave, they had to be aware of the snakes, of the tigers, of the dangers. So they focus on that. And you can see the animals too. They, they do, they, they're very vigilant. We have that in us. And it has become such a habit that only negative things impress us. And we only remember negative things. So when there are so many good conditions in our lives. Like, look at you. You are young, you are healthy, you are so beautiful, you're just gorgeous, right? But do you know that? You know that you are so beautiful, that you are so handsome? Hmm? Good, he's nodding his head. We, <laughs> just say, okay. You know, we need to do that. Yesterday, I gave a consultation to a woman. She's a beautiful woman. But she has gone through such trauma in her life. She's had such destructive relationships because she just didn't know her own value. And when I told her, do you know that you are beautiful? She said, really? Oh my gosh, she's lived 50 something years. And when I asked her, she expressed such surprise that I was surprised by her surprise. 
we should know our own value. You see, this practice is so important. You do it for yourself. You look into, you look at the mirror, you look at your eyes, and you say, thank you, eyes. I have eyes that can still see, that are healthy. Thank you, eyes. You look at your hair, you have a head full of hair, and you are thankful. Thank you, hair. You know, when we are sick, we have to wear a wig. When we are sick, our hair becomes very weak. See? You look in the mirror, you look at your teeth and say, Thank you, teeth. One day, we'll have to wear denture, right? We'll have crowns, we'll have root canals. But now you have real teeth. You see? These are the things that are there, but we take for granted. But you know, as somebody who's a millionaire, let's say they are in their 60s, 70s, you know that they have millions of dollars. But all they wish really is your beautiful skin, your healthy teeth, your healthy heart, your strong feet. But they can't. They can't have those things. And money cannot buy them those things. You see? So to appreciate what we have is so important. It gives us that confidence and strength. Huh? It gives us that positive energy so that we can care for ourselves. So when the storms, you know, storms come, we are strong and stable from within and we can withstand the storm. Does it make sense? Huh? And a Chinese, a Chinese character for enough, check this out, is this. What does it mean to be enough? Because you, probably many of you feel you are not enough. How many of you feel, oh, I'm not enough, I'm not good enough, I'm not good in this, I'm not good in that. Can you raise your hands? Yeah? Yeah, most of us, if not all of us, right? We feel, you know, I wish I could be like her, like him. I wish I could have this and that. I'm not enough, right? But look at this Chinese character for enough. Can you tell what, what this means? What it means? It's a mouth. It stands for a mouth, okay? This, what stands for? The body, okay? This is an arm, okay? And what about this? The legs, so like this, standing. Can you see that character? Yeah? The mouth represents the head, yeah? The body, the arm, the two legs. This means enough. Enough. So, do you have a head? Yes. You got a body? You got arms? Even just one arm is good enough, you know that? And do you have two legs? Does that make you enough? Are you enough then, Gong? Yeah? Say it loudly, confidently. Are you enough? Yes. Are you enough? Yes. yes, you are more than enough. More than enough. So remember this. When you feel, oh, I'm not beautiful enough, I'm not strong enough, I'm not smart enough, just say, no, I have, you know, I have intelligence. I always make efforts. Huh? I have a body. I have arms. I have legs. I have eyes. I have teeth. I have a roof over my house. Yeah? I have somebody. I have a mom. Some of us are lucky to have a mom and a dad, right? I have somebody to care for me. I can go to school, I have friends. Can you remember those things? And when you remember those things, and just remember, that makes you enough. So what makes you enough is not what you can get more. It's not like that, because a millionaire doesn't feel, doesn't think that he's enough. A model doesn't think she's beautiful enough, you know that? 
Even Michelle Pfeiffer didn't think she was beautiful enough. So it's not what we get more that we are enough. It's that we know what we have and we appreciate it. That makes us enough. You see the difference? You already have more than enough. All you need to do is to recognize what you have and cherish it and take care of it. That makes you enough right here and right now. Not one day, not but if. It's right now. Okay? So let us enjoy one sound of the bell and touch that. Okay? Thank you. The practice of flowering waters. Thank you for my head full of hair. Thank you for my eyes. Thank you for my smile. Thank you for my awesome body. Huh? I can walk, I can dance, I can run, I can sit. Thank you for my toes. Okay? We, li we listen to a sound of the bell and we say thank you to ourselves. So please remember this, when you go through a storm of self-doubt, oh, I'm not good enough, I'm nobody, please sit down, please come back to your breath, please look deeply and recognize all the conditions that, that you have already and smile and say, I am enough. And that storm of self-doubt will pass over. You may have to go through it again and again, but every time you're able to sit down and remind yourself that you are enough, what you are doing is that you're building neural pathways in your brain, okay? Neural pathways. I will explain to you. You remember this image already, right? Of the storm and the eye in the storm, right? I'm sorry about this board. It's a bit, um, <laughs> but it's enough <laughs> for our purpose. Okay, so I would like you to understand about how your brain works a little more, okay? So this is, let's say, a cell body okay, of a neuron. And this is the axon of the neuron, okay? And then down here, there will be some Branches, yeah, yeah, branches. Let's say there's another neuron standing somewhere nearby. Also have a nucleus, also have an axon, okay? Also have some branches, the dendrites. Neurons communicate with each other all the time. Okay? So for example, this neuron wants to communicate with this one. So these, the, the branches here, for example, right here. This axon, neuron A, this neuron B, it will send down electrical impulses, a message down, okay? It goes there, it goes to this branch right here, and it will release chemicals <coughs> called neurotransmitters, okay, right here. And this one, this neuron B here, at this point, it will be stimulated. It will receive that message, and it will go back to this neuron. So that's how they communicate, just like I want to communicate with you, I give out my hand, and you give out your hand, and we give the message, okay? And you receive, 
and then you give it to the next person. You see that? Huh? So they, they communicate with each other like this. And do you know that in your adolescent years, right here and right now, your neurons are so incredibly active. Okay? What you have, let's say, what you have, uh, let's say, a hundred billion axons. Actually, we have 300 billion axons in our body, neurons in our body, okay? in our brain. And during this time, in these years, it's so important because whichever neurons that you don't use, they will be pruned, they will be deleted. Okay? Whatever neurons that you use, the connections that you use, that fire and wire together, they, be, they will become strengthened. Does it make sense? It's like you exercise. If you use this arm a lot, what will happen to this arm? It will get strong, right? It will get big. But if you don't exercise this arm at all, then what will happen to this arm? Yep, it will atrophy. That's the term. Atrophy means it just shrinks. This one gets bigger, but this one shrinks. So the brain is the same way in the brain right now. Your neurons, those that are used a lot, will get stronger. This right here, the connection right here, gets so strong. Even the axons themselves will get bigger. The transmission, the electrical signals will go faster, you know? So literally, in your brain, the areas that you use will get buffer, big like this. And the areas that you don't use, will just shrink, literally, will get pruned off. So we know this happens throughout our lives. You know that? Throughout our lives. Before, they thought it just happens in children and in teenagers. But now we know it happens through our lives. But right here and right now, as adolescents, it happens so strongly. It is a time for you to really water the good seeds in yourself, the skills that you want to have in your life. If you want to know languages, learn them now. If you want to play sports well, do it now. If you want to read and learn about history, about science, do it now. Because your brain is so incredibly active and it is selecting those parts that are used a lot and that will get strong. And those parts that aren't used a lot, they will prune off, okay? So that's what they call as neuroplasticity. Have you heard of this term? Plasticity, Plas like they call a plastic brain. It means that a brain that is changeable, that is malleable, huh? that is modifiable, a brain that is always constantly changing. It interacts with the environment and it's shaped by the experience, by the environment. You know that? Isn't that amazing, Kang? So when you water the flowers in yourself and you say, I am enough, I am enough, I'm okay. I always do my best. I don't have to compare myself with others, you know? I can just be my beautiful self. You are actually strengthening these certain connections in your brain. And the more you tell yourself that, the stronger these connections. So that the thought of self-doubt will become less and less, will become weaker. But the self-love, self-confidence, and self-care will be stronger, you see? And it will help you to do the things that you want to do. Because even if you have very good talents, you know, there are people who are very talented, but they doubt themselves all the time. And what happens when they practice, oh, I'm not good enough? It's like you punch yourself. And how do you expect yourself to be strong if you keep punching yourself? It's like a boxer, you know? You punch yourself, you punch yourself, you try to get up, you try to get up, but at some point you're so tired you can't get up anymore. That's what we do to ourselves. 
we strengthen the neurons that punch ourselves, that put ourselves down. And then we wonder why we fail in life. We cause ourselves failure, you see? So make sure to use the neuroplasticity in your advantage. Think positive. Remember, this character, it makes you enough as you are. And when you feel you're enough, you can smile. And then you do your best. Your mind is spacious, your mind is so you know, active and intelligent, you can learn things. Maybe slower than some, doesn't matter as long as you learn it. You know what I mean? You take your time. Each brain will work differently. Each person will be different. We don't have to expect to be ourselves to be like anybody else. You see? So neuroplasticity, remember this. And it works for the better and also for the worse. If we keep strengthening, you know, the muscle of escape, okay, when you're stressed, you go to play the computer, you play video games, you watch movies. Some people even go to pornography sites, right? The more you do that, the more that muscle, certain connections will be strong, and it becomes a habit. You see? Now, repeated actions, okay? Thoughts, words, when they are repeated, when they are rehearsed, okay? They will strengthen certain neural pathways and they will become habits, okay? Habits of thinking in a certain way. Habits of speaking in a certain way. Habits of behaving in a certain way. Think of these drawings of these diagrams and then you understand why, okay? And habits will become what? Can anybody guess? Habits become personality. Some of us who see, oh, when I was a child, I was so happy, I was so carefree. But then as I become a teenager, and I, as I play more video games, and I watch more movies, YouTube, TikToks, yeah, I become more withdrawn. I feel socially awkward. Yeah? I feel distant from my parents, from my friends. Now, when I feel bad, I just close the door and I lie down in the dark or I watch movies. But that's just the way I am. That's who I am. You see it? You begin to believe that's your personality. Many teenagers change, develop a different personality. It's because the certain actions, thoughts, and words that we've been repeating in our heads, with our mouth, with our body, certain thoughts, speech, and actions our parents have repeated, and we have inculcated, ingrained, it has become ingrained in us. So now that becomes habits and thus our personality. You see that? And a personality will lead to what? A personality will lead to our destiny, my dear ones. Okay? It's like I knew a, a, a a man in his 60s, when he was young, a child, his parents fought a lot, and there was some you know, sexual misconducts, the behaviors in both of his parents. He was very sad and confused, 
and then he saw some adults in his home watch pornography. Yeah? And he followed that example. And he felt, oh, that could release my stress. When I watch those things, I can forget about things that were going on with my mom and my dad, with my family, with my situation. Repeated actions. Slowly, it became his habits. When he went to high school, to college, he continued to watch pornography. As an adult, he's addicted. He's a sex addict. He got married. His wife is loving, is beautiful, but he still has to watch pornography. And his family is broken. And he's somebody is very, you know, successful in his career. A scientist. And yet, he's so ashamed of himself. And he cannot help it. You see? This destiny to be a sex addict, to have one broken marriage after another, because it's not sustainable, you know, and he's not healthy physically and mentally. You see? So that is why, my dear ones, it's so important for you to understand as young people, you are not entirely helpless and hopeless as you think. Actually, you can make choices. Okay? Your parents may have their problems. You cannot solve their problems. But you can help them by just taking care, care of yourselves. Okay? Ask yourself, what kind of actions, thoughts and words am I repeating? Are they positive? Or are they negative? Do I want them to form these neural pathways to become habits? Do I want that kind of personality? Do I wish to have that kind of destiny or not? And if you say yes, then you reinforce it, and it will become that. But if you know that that's not what you want, you don't want to grow up and be a drug addict, a sex addict, yeah? You don't want to grow up and break your own heart, and you break people's hearts, you know? Then choose, choose more wisely each moment what you do. Because everything that you do really matters. People say, oh, it doesn't matter what I say. Oh, it doesn't matter what I do. But it matters, it matters. Because every time you do, chemicals are released, and connections are made. You know? And one thought you think, it's like a trail, one-time connection. You think it again, it's a little thicker. You think it again, a little thicker. Short-term memory becomes long-term memory. Before you know it, it becomes a freeway. You only need to think of one thought, a thousand thoughts come in that aspect. It's just like you Google search, you Google search, let's say, something, uh, Tom Cruise, who, who's the current hot uh, actor. Right? You just go, wow, so many videos of that person or sites about that person appears, right? One thought will trigger a thousand thoughts, just like the search bar when you use. Yeah? They link, they associate. So it's so important that you learn to recognize the positive things in your life and to be grateful and to reinforce that, okay? So let us breathe together. Again, again, we come back and give rise to thanks to ourselves. Just simply say thank you for you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for making the efforts. Thank you for being alive.
you know about traffickers? You've heard of the term before? People who kidnap young people and then they sell, make them a slave. So one trafficker, he was interviewed how he was able to kidnap young people. And he said, I go to a bus station, an airport, a crowded place, and I go up to a young woman, or sometimes even a young man, okay? And I say, your eyes look beautiful. And if she looks down, I go to a young woman, I say, your eyes look so beautiful. And she said, oh, thank you. He said, I know I have no chance with her. And then he walks away. He goes up to another young woman. He said the same thing. Wow, your eyes look beautiful. And she looks down. She said, no, they don't. He said, I got her. You understand? They pick up your insecurity. They pick up your self-doubt. Bullies also do that. They see you're afraid, timid, so they pick on you. But if in your daily life, you water, you practice watering the flowers in yourself. Thank you, thanking yourself. Recognize the efforts you make, however small. Recognize what you have, you know, as it is. Not more, not less. And be grateful for it. There is this self-love, self-confidence. There's this stability in you. That when somebody comes along and picks on you or says something unkind, it won't touch you because you know your own value. Yeah, yeah. When we are e we are easily swayed and hurt hmm, because we feel not enough inside. Okay? And you see, one woman who has confidence just to say thank you, she remains free. But the next woman, the next boy, who said no. I'm not good enough. And it can lead to a life of servitude, of slavery. You know that? So it's so important that we learn to love ourselves, to appreciate ourselves as we are. Okay, come. Now I want to go to the second part of beginning anew. Eh? What is the second part of beginning anew? Yes, express regrets. First part is to say thank you, okay? That's an easy way to remember watering the flowers or to say thank you. The second part is to express regrets or another way to say it is I'm sorry. I'm sorry. And we say I'm sorry all the time in our daily life, but that is not deep enough. We learn to say sorry to ourselves, okay? So if you think of a negative thought towards yourself, you can say, I'm sorry, I didn't mean that. I'm sorry, I hurt you. Huh? Each one of us, there's an inner child. Now you are 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. Anybody who's 19 in the teens program? Yeah. That's your inner child right now. No? Take good care of your inner child, my dear. Whether you are 12, 13, or 14, 15, 16, 18, 19, like take good care of him, of her. Take good care of this person, okay? Because the adults spend a lot of time going back to their childhood and taking care of their inner child, <laughs> trying to visualize that inner child, what that inner child was going through, was thinking, was feeling, and trying to embrace. But now you're living that inner child right now. So get to know yourself, okay? So years later, you don't have to go back and try to heal this inner child. Take good care 
of yourself. Okay? So this is to learn to say sorry. If you feel, if you think, or you say, or you do something negative to yourself, just say, I'm sorry. It's so powerful when you're able to thank yourself and to say you are sorry to yourself. It helps you keep that dignity, that integrity in yourself. Okay? If you are unkind to somebody, your mom, your dad, a friend, you see somebody, you pick on somebody, or you said something sarcastic, and you think back, you're like, oh, I'm so sorry I did that. I'm sorry I tried to make somebody small so that I can feel bigger. I'm sorry. It's really important if you can recognize that. Okay? I'm really sorry. It helps you to maintain an integrity in yourself. Otherwise, we develop such negative habits and a personality that we don't even want to look at ourselves. We try to cover up, but we are so far away from ourselves. You see? I'm sorry. I'm sorry that happens to me or I'm sorry that I did that to somebody else in thoughts, speech, and bodily action. Okay? Also, when things go wrong, I have learned because I work a lot with young people and also because I work a lot with my inner child. When things go wrong, we often blame it on ourselves. It's called a child's logic. When just two months ago, in Deer Park Monastery, that's where I, I reside, is in California, the US. We had a teen camp, almost a hundred teens came. And sitting in a circle, one young teenager said, I blame myself for my mother's death. That was like so heavy and surprising. And I asked him, how is that so? And he said, well, my mother had cancer and she died four or five years ago. And I felt so bad. And after a while it came to me, it's my fault that she died. Sometimes when a child or a teenager gets abused, physically, verbally, or sexually, we also blame it on ourselves. It must be my fault that happened to me. I must be really bad. That's why bad things come to me. But I want you to know, and I want you to tell yourself, it's not your fault, okay? It's not your fault that your parents fight, or that they get a divorce or that they are unhappy, or that they are sick. It's not your fault that something goes wrong in the family. Okay? Adults are not perfect. They have li their limitations. And they spread their sadness and anger and suffering to us as children as teenagers, you see? At this moment, you are victims of the circumstance. It's not your fault. That's important you realize that and that you tell yourself, it's not my fault. Because when I, you know, a knot, like you get a rope and you tie it, in Buddhism, there's actually a term called internal knot. Okay? You tie it, a knot. And then you think that thought again, you form another knot right on top of that knot. And you keep forming. Can you visualize the knot? Now you get knotted, 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 knot, knot like this. Can you see it? Yeah? In our 
child's logic of blaming ourselves, of putting ourselves down, of hating ourselves, we form these internal knots, all knotted up, that actually some of us may feel choked right here, or we feel that knot right here tightened, or right here it's so tightened you cannot even breathe, literally. Whatever your mind experiences, your body experiences. Your body manifests your mind. You know that? For example, you feel sad, suddenly you have no more energy, you don't even want to get out of bed. You see? You see how the body manifests the mind? Yeah? So these knotted thoughts get stuck in our body. So it's so important that we learn to speak to ourselves. Did you practice deep relaxation? Yeah? You lie down? That's another practice that you can help the storm to pass over. You just lie down and you breathe and you scan through your body and you thank you eyes, thank you nose, thank you teeth, smile, relax my face. And if you scan to a certain part and you feel the knots, yeah, you breathe into those parts longer, deeper, so that that knot right there loosen up, unravel. Okay? If you feel that pain in your arm, breathe or massage it. If you feel in your chest, put a hand on your chest and breathe and loosen it. Okay? It's so important that you recognize the knot as it's forming. And you breathe, and you relax, then it's unravel. You see? If you don't recognize it, it will knot it up. And then another thought, and another thought. But every time it's knotting up, you breathe, it's undoing. You keep undoing it. You see the difference? Now, that is what you can do. That is a choice you can make. When your parents fight, when your parents suffer, you can get all knotted up like this, or you can just sit down, remove yourself from the situation, go to your room, but not to watch movies or to do things to escape. Literally, just sit down and breathe, or lie down and breathe, and unknot yourself. Does it make sense? Okay, let us practice. Okay. Visualize the situation happening, your heart beats fast, your body tenses up, and now instead of getting all knotted up in body and mind, breathe. And literally visualize it's unraveling, unknotting itself. Okay. of a stress response. Yeah? Okay, so there are three, four ways we can respond. When something you're in a situation stressful, there's one way you can, your body, your, your brain automa automatically makes a decision and that is to fight. You, yeah? You fight back. Okay? Another way is what? You don't fight, but you, you run away. Yes. Huh? Uh, slowly go. No, 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 no. 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 Fight. The same. Okay, yep. You fight. Okay? 
Another way, yeah, another way is that you run away. Yeah? So they call that fight or flight. What's the, what's the third response? You freeze or you faint. Okay? Or you faint. It's like a mouse running away from a cat. Huh? That's fighting, running. But when it discovers it cannot run away, it just freeze and fall dead. And the cat is not interested anymore because it thought the mouse is dead, so it walks away. And you know what? The mouse gets up and runs away. So these are the responses that our, our brain, our nervous system makes automatically. Recognize in yourself what kind of coping mechanism that you often, that your body often chooses. Who usually fight in stressful situations? Who usually fight? Raise your hands. Yeah? So you usually fight. Okay? All right. Who usually find yourself running away, avoiding the situation? Okay? All right. Yeah? Both. You, in some situations, actually, we fight. In some situations, we, we fly. Yeah? What about freeze? Who see yourself? Sometimes you just freeze. You don't know it. You, yeah, you just become speechless. You just freeze on the spot, right? Recognize those things in yourself, okay? Now, when stressful situations take place, the body, the mind, make that decision for us, for the most part. And for the most part, it works. But again, whatever mechanism, the coping mechanism is repeated so often, that can become habits. So we have to be careful, you see, because there are adults in their adolescent years, in their childhood, there were traumas. And they employed a coping mechanism like fighting back huh? or running away or freezing. But what happened is that they got stuck in that coping mechanism, stuck. So now they're adults, there's no trauma. There's no fighting in the family, there's no abuse, and yet they keep fighting. Or they keep running away, running away from themselves, running away from their, you know, from their marriage, from relationships, from their jobs, you see? They just like, oh, I'm not good enough. I run before I fail. I'm going to fail anyway, so I just run before I, I fail. So it's like a self-fulfilling prophecy. You say, I fail, so I will make myself fail anyway. You see? Or there are those adults who are just frozen from within. They do things, you look, they look very normal, but inside they feel very numb. They cannot connect with their children, with their spouses, with themselves, they don't feel much. You see? That can happen because it has become their personality and thus their destiny. You see? But you are, as adolescents, as adults, and if you are aware of this, you say, oh, okay, I think I usually fight even when it's not that important, that's not that necessary. I don't want that to become a habit. So instead of, you know, shouting back or fighting, you breathe and you be still. You be this tree. You be in the eye of the storm. You see? You can choose. You can choose to be in the eye of the storm instead of fighting or running away, or freezing, you can be calm. You can be stable like a tree. You can be stable like a mountain. So that it doesn't become a bad habit. Does it make sense to you, huh? Yeah? Because we don't have to fight all the time. Or we don't have to run away all the time. You see? We don't have to freeze all the time. We don't want those things to become our habits. 
You see? So when you recognize that, you are actually learning to care for yourself. It is in your power, my dear. You are not helpless and hopeless. You can choose with awareness, with mindfulness, okay? And when there are certain regrets that you have about yourself, about your life, there are certain hurts that take place, if you care for yourself, then actually you will touch very deep love for yourself, deep appreciation for yourself. And you can forgive yourself too. Sometimes we feel very ashamed. We blame on ourselves. Yeah? Oh, I did that, I did this. It's my fault. But we can also sit quietly and say, I'm sorry. I'm sorry I did that. That wasn't kind towards myself. That wasn't kind towards my parents or my friends or somebody who tried to help me. (coughs) Yeah? I'm sorry. I forgive myself. I will do better. See? So you are undoing the knots like that. Self-love, self-forgiveness. We can do that. Hmm? I want to ask you, what is your understanding of a soulmate? Can you describe to me what's a soulmate? What's your idea of a soulmate? Answer. Someone that understands you. Somebody that understands you. Good. Someone you trust. Someone you trust. Wonderful. Huh? Anything else you want to add? Um, someone that enhances your good parts. Uh, someone that enhances the Enhances the goodness in you, huh? the good parts in you. Wonderful. What about the young man? Yes, Kang. Anna? Someone you love? Someone who cares about you. Someone who cares about you. Wonderful. Huh? All right. These are wonderful, wonderful qualities, right? Okay. For the last five minutes, I will introduce to you this Chinese character for soulmate. Okay. And I just block out how to write it. <laughs> Okay, let me think how, how to write a soulmate. Okay, so I'll just write it in Vietnamese. Since. Not thinking of it in this moment. The Vietnamese word for soulmate is tri kỷ. Yes, I am. Something with a khẩu. Thank you, my dear. Excellent. Okay, yes, you're right, next to there. Thank you. These are Chinese characters for soulmate, okay? Or Vietnamese words for tri kỷ, soulmate. Check this out. Tri, it means to remember. To remember. D also means to know. Okay? D also means to care for or to master. Huh? And you know what K means? Oneself. So many. Bless you. Is one who remembers herself, himself. One who knows oneself. One who cares for oneself. One who masters oneself. So when you describe one, you know, who's there for you, who understands you, you know, whom you can trust, who loves you, you are describing yourself. 
you're describing yourself. There are many adults who don't know what's a soulmate. They think a soulmate is somebody out there. So they spend their whole entire life looking for a soulmate. You have so many partners, go through so many marriages, and it's all broken. You never find a soulmate. And a person who, who goes through life like that doesn't believe in love anymore. And if you, can, you don't believe in love, you cannot be truly happy. But when you are young like this, and you realize, wow, a soulmate is myself. I can learn to remember my own breathing, my own steps, my own body. I learn to know my own body, my own thoughts and feelings. I learn to care for them, hmm? to master the response of fighting all the time, huh? the coping mechanism of running away or freezing all the time. I am learning to be my own soulmate. I'm learning to be my own soulmate. Isn't that? It will be a great happiness. You know that? In my monastic life, as a nun, that's what I've learned to do, to be my own soulmate. And it makes me so happy, you know? And when you are your own soulmate, you can be a soulmate to others. You get to know and care for others so deeply because you have that wealth, that source right inside of you. You're not looking for somebody because you are so poor, you have nothing, but you, are, you have so much that you can share and give others. You see the difference? So what's a soulmate, my dear one? Can you give me a definition of a soulmate? One who? Remember ourselves. Remember ourselves. What else? Know ourselves. know ourselves. What else? Care for ourselves. Care for ourselves. What else? Master ourselves. And brothers and sisters teach you all of these mindfulness practices to help you do just that. Yeah? To do just that. Every day you can do that. And it will help you to take care of the storms that arise in your body, in your mind, in your household, in your life. It will help you to really be able to say, the storm is passing over, and I am caring for myself, and I'm still here, and I am whole, okay? I am enough. Actually, I'm more than enough. Yeah? Okay, my dear ones. Bless you. Let us enjoy breathing together, sitting stably, strong, like strong, healthy mountains, strong, healthy trees. Coming back to the roots of our body, that's like your belly a little bit beneath it, and just breathe from that area. Feel your abdomen, your belly rise. Feel it fall, rise and fall. Anchor your mind in that place. Bring it down to the roots of your trunk. I love you so much.